A wonderful, wonderful buzz in the room tonight. It's fantastic. Um, and I hope you bring that buzz after the, the lecture to the, the, the drinks at the Shaw Library, which is in the old building over the other side. A short walk, and I hope you join us for that. Um, my name's Charlie Beckett. I'm the head of the Department of Media and Communications here at the LSE. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to you all to our inaugural lecture for our new colleague, Nick Caldry, who's our new professor of media communications and social theory. I bring with me, as it were, a message from Craig Calhoun, who is the director of the London School of Economics. Normally, this would have been done with a sort of gold-embossed sheet of vellum. But uh, in this case, Craig tweeted this morning, um, damn, I'm sorry, I'll miss Nick Caldry's lecture. Um, that's what happens when you hire Americans. Um, this, <laughs> this, is, this is very much uh, Nick's event, but it's also part of the department's 10th anniversary celebrations. And we're particularly pleased to have Nick back in the department as we grow and develop. We've got very exciting new teaching and research initiatives coming up over the next few years, as well as the continued uh, expansion of our uh, special projects such as POLIS, our journalism think tank, and the media policy project run by uh, Damien Tambini. I'm very pleased that there's so many people here tonight uh, who have come from outside the LSE and from other institutions, including our friends from Nick's former home at Goldsmiths, because we are a department that loves uh, to connect beyond the LSE. And I'm also particularly pleased that we've got Mike Savage, um, head of the sociology department here at the LSE, chairing tonight, because we're also very much an interdisciplinary department that loves to connect beyond media and communication. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Please uh, join us, as I say, for those drinks in the Shaw Library. But now over to Mike and Nick. Thanks. Thanks for that, Charlie. You're saying I'm Mike Savage, um, head of the Department of Sociology. Excuse my throat. I was giving something similar last night, and I just haven't, haven't quite recovered. Um, but I'm, very, I'm very pleased to be chairing this uh, lecture, not just because we're colleagues in the same university, but I have particular interests in the interface between sociology, culture, and media. So I'm, I'm really interested in actually what Nick has to say. Um, and um, let me say a few words about his career. He's, um, he began doing a degree in classics, um, moved into law, spent several years as a successful solicitor, and ever since, uh, and, uh, um, retraining as a media and communications expert, he sort of bounced between LSE and Goldsmiths a few times, <laughs> north and south of the river, um, began at Goldsmiths, and then has moved to the LSE in the early 2000s when he worked in the joint department at that time of sociology um, uh, and, and media, and he helped set up the Cultural Society MSC, on which I taught on last year, and Don Slater, who is in the room somewhere, was involved in that very important inter intervention. He then left the LSE, um, I think, seven or eight years ago. He spent uh, seven, seven years at Goldsmiths, where he had a big impact, huge impact in developing the, one of the top departments in the country. We are very fortunate here at the LSE to, to lure him back um, and bring him back here, um, and hopefully this will help um, develop collaborations in the years to come, not just between our two departments, but across other departments of the LSE. Nick's interests obviously straddle anthropology and politics and economics, so he has a huge amount to offer across the whole school. He is an amazingly prolific author. Um, his new book, Ethics of Media, is, I think, available outside. I know, it's Media Society World. Uh, Media Society World, sorry. <laughs> I can't keep up. Sorry, it's too many for too many to keep up. Um, he's probably best known for his book on media rituals of 2002, but has an extensive uh, body of work increasingly focusing upon issues of um, uh, big data and digital media, which, of course, are an issue which preoccupy and interest all of us today. So without further ado, I'll introduce Nick to talk about unnecessary disenchantment, myth, agency and injustice in the digital age. Thanks. 
Um, thanks very much, Mike. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, apologies for my cough, my voice too. I hope it doesn't interrupt the service too much. Um, it's really great that so many of you could come, particularly those who I know have travelled from afar. It's thrilling for me to see you all here. And I'm delighted to be back at LSE, and particularly its Department of Media and Communications, after seven years away. And in marking my return, I want to give you some idea of how I've been thinking and researching about media and communications over the past 20 years and of the themes that currently preoccupy me. I'm interested in how certain institutions with concentrated power over the production and circulation of symbols, we usually call them media, have for at least two centuries been bound up with our possibilities of knowing the social. And by the term social, I mean the web of interrelationships and dependencies between human beings, which are always in part relations of meaning. Media are institutions with particular power over the means for representing shared reality. Reality that becomes recognised as ours in part through what media do. To grasp how this power works, we need to follow the larger stories about society and the social world that get told through and about our everyday uses of media. And that means making media's familiarity strange and taking, as feminist sociologist Dorothy Smith put it, the everyday world as problematic. In that spirit, I will use the language of anthropology to describe three myths by which the relations between media and social knowledge have been framed and disguised. Myths that have emerged at different times but now overlap with each other. And I'll call them the myth of the mediated centre, the myth of us, and the myth of big data. That is, the myth of big data as social knowledge. The institutions we usually call media, TV and radio companies, newspaper corporations, were central to the first myth, but are increasingly displaced in the second and third, as centralised information and image flows, media, become entangled with the sustaining of platforms for social interaction. Facebook, Twitter, Weibo and with the continuous gathering of data about us, whose value those platforms depend upon, and so too increasingly do all the media and cultural industries. Now, calling these very different processes myths enables us to see an underlying pattern in how, as societies, we make sense of organising things around assumptions that certain types of information, expertise, knowledge are more valuable than others and offer us a privileged view on the reality of social life. And I say we because these myths are not merely an elite production. We are all potentially involved in producing these myths through our everyday actions, which makes myth a more useful term, incidentally, for all this than ideology. Each myth I've mentioned has a distinct domain, a distinctive effect, and a distinctive set of beneficiaries. So let me just anticipate my story a little. The myth of the mediated centre has as its domain the organisation of everyday life and resources around the productions of large media institutions. And its effect is to make sense of inclusive media-based social collectivities. Historically, these have been focused on national, sometimes regional, broadcasting territories. This myth has various beneficiaries. Approximately, the media institutions themselves. Ultimately, government, which needs large media to provide the means for assuming that it can still talk to its population. And advertisers, or at least those advertisers still interested in buying access to whole populations or segments of them. The much newer myth of us has as its domain our activities of social interaction as registered by social media platforms. And its effect is to underwrite the belief on which those platforms rely that this is where we now come together. The us here is not necessarily national anymore, it's just as easily transnational. Now, there we are, someone's intervening. Um, haven't got the big data yet, maybe they know that. Um, <laughs> 
The myths immediate, the second myth, the myth of us, the myths immediate beneficiaries are the platform owners, while the ultimate benefit passes to the institutions, from government to marketers, who still want to remain in touch with us this way. And then the big, the myth of big data is the strangest of the three myths that I'll discuss tonight because it seems to have nothing to do with media institutions and its operations are indeterminate in scale. Its domain is simply everything. The entire extent of the data we generate as we live and interact. And its effect is to reinforce our belief that such data offer a new route to social knowledge as well. Its proximate beneficiaries, obviously, are the new data mining and data analysis industries. Its ultimate beneficiaries are businesses, which want continuous marketing access to whatever we do, and states, which are rethinking government as a version of total data access. Each such myth, by rationalising a certain perspective on how we come to know the social, obscures our possibilities for imagining, describing and enacting the social another way. And each myth to be unpacked requires its own distinctive type of interpretation or hermeneutic. And this is where the special power of the myth of big data emerges – Because it challenges the very idea that the social is something that we can interpret at all. I'll return to this anti-human hermeneutic danger later on. But for now, I'll recall the great philosopher, the the late Bernard Williams, who articulated that danger poignantly in one of his last public lectures. We, We run, he said, the risk that the whole humanity's enterprise of trying to understand ourselves is coming to seem peculiar. And yet, he wrote, we all have an interest in the life of that study, not just a shared interest, but an interest in its being a shared interest. And indeed, that interest is integral, I think, to any notion of social understanding. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back to the beginning of my story. What exactly do I mean by media? Well, media are, first of all, technological means for producing, circulating and receiving communications. We would have no media unless human life were constituted, in a crucial respect, by communications, by the exchanges of signs that enable acts of communication to make sense, to accumulate over time as meaning, as knowledge. As Paul Ricoeur put it, Substituting signs for things is more than a mere effect in social life. It is its very foundation. But it became essential at a certain point in history to mark off the work of media infrastructures from the general flow of communications. And this occurred when technological forms of communications emerged that could consistently and reliably transmit certain bundles of meaning, such as newspapers, across large territories. Many would associate all this with the start of large-scale printing in the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe. The notion of the media, in which I've been strongly interested in my work, emerged in the early 20th century, at least according to the Oxford English Dictionary, found of all wisdom, and with the interconnected growth of the modern state, modern economy, and modern media institutions. That is, stable infrastructures and networks for producing and circulating communication packages to a state's whole population. And the social theorist who paid most attention to these shifts was from France, Gabriel Tard. Through newspapers, radio, film, and TV's intensified forms of simultaneity, media gathered populations, or at least they seemed to, in rituals of national attention that initially took quite curious, bizarre forms, such as in Britain, the media event of the Oxford and Cambridge boat race. I still remember my mother wearing an Oxford blue ribbon and telling me I must watch the TV on the race day. She'd never been to university. Now, such rituals involved, of course, into more stable genres, the coronation, 1953 in Britain, 1958 in Japan, the state funeral, 1963 in the United States, 1965 in Britain, and so on. But media institutions' relations to social knowledge have been entangled from the start with the categories, the norms, the exclusions through which some notion of national life or culture gets constituted. 
Understanding these relations means going beyond the analysis of particular media contents and production processes and considering media institutions' role in the stories we tell about ourselves as members of a social domain or indeed of a democratic one. Raymond Williams captured this in his 1974 inaugural lecture at Cambridge when he wrote of the role of television drama in providing images, representations of what living is now like in societies that were becoming increasingly opaque. But it was a Latin American scholar, Jesus Martin Barbero from Colombia, who summed up most neatly the shift that the content-based media research must undergo to fulfil Williams' core insight. And he wrote a book called From the Media to the Mediations. Oddly, the English edition relegated the Spanish main title to subtitle, but I'm delighted to know we've got the translator in, uh, in, the, in the room today, so maybe we can discuss that later. I like the original Spanish title. And then in Britain, Roger Silverstone, the founder of LSE's Department of Media and Communications, against the prevailing fashions of media research, argued for a wider view of the social and cultural processes that media constitute, and he called that mediation. I've tried to maintain this tradition of thinking about media institutions' consequences for social knowledge through the term myth, which I introduced a few minutes ago. And I use the term the myth of the mediated centre to point to the long history whereby media institutions became increasingly implicated in the languages, practices and organisational logics of whole societies. Now this myth still exists today and it makes sense of our organising our lives around the content flows of media organisations. I wake up with a radio alarm to the Today programme, maybe some of you do too. This myth tells us that society has a centre of value, knowledge and meaning, and that particular institutions, those we call media, have a privileged role in giving us access to that supposed centre. Media institutions work hard to sustain that myth, telling us that we're all watching, that this programme or event shows what's going on for us as a society. And of course, so too do other institutions, such as governments and political parties, which depend on something like a mediated centre to underwrite their space of appearances. This is how media institution symbolic power gets reproduced. Media have evolved elaborate categories of thought to express the myth of their centrality. The language of liveness, of celebrity, the greater value given to what's in the media over what isn't. But I've always argued we need to disenchant that language not because it's necessarily bad for us, but in order to grasp all the work that gets done to keep it in place and sustain its particular perspective on social knowledge. Paradoxically, this analysis of mine has become less controversial in the digital age as the plausibility of the myth of the mediated centre has declined, or we feel should in some way have declined. In the past 10 years, it's become ever more obvious when media are telling us they are central to our lives and to society's life, and why they are telling us this. Because for some sectors, such as the press, audiences have declined irreversibly, while all traditional media must now compete for our attention with many other communication interfaces. But the myth of the Mediated Centre still, I think, provides a useful reference point to interpret the next media format that claims a privileged standpoint on our shared reality. We still, I think, need that hermeneutic of suspicion. However, such a hermeneutic is no longer enough to grasp what the media are doing and what we are now doing with media. It's not that media have disappeared or that media's claims to be central have diminished. Arguably, as I've said, those claims have become more insistent. It's rather that the whole terrain of media and media institutions has been reshaped by huge external forces. Fundamental has been what Rainey and Wellman call the triple revolution of, first, the internet as a personalised mode of one-to-one and many-to-many communications. Second, then, the continuous availability of both interpersonal and mass communication while we're on the move, often through the same device, And thirdly, as a result, the intensification of social networking. A key tool, of course, for such networking has been social media platforms, such as Facebook. 
Social media are of fundamental importance to the myth of the mediated centre because they offer or seem to a new form of centrality, a new social liveness, mediated apparently by us, or rather than by content-producing media institutions. So the implications for media as social institutions are profound. When we think about media today, we cannot sharply separate, as we once did, media infrastructure for the centralised distribution of institutional content from communications infrastructure for distributed, interpersonal forms of communication that we do. Both now flow into and over each other and across the same platforms. However, there's no question of social media simply substituting for mass media institutions. Large-scale media content producers and the cultural industries that are linked to them, such as advertising, which I'll come back to, are already closely involved in social media. Indeed, social media platforms, far from being an authentic grassroots social response to large media, represent an entirely new business model for media and communications infrastructures. And as this new way of organising business and our lives around digital platforms becomes the new normal, a new myth is emerging to make sense of this. A new myth about the collectivities that we form when we use platforms such as Facebook. An emerging myth of natural collectivity that's particularly seductive because here traditional media institutions seem to have dropped out altogether from the picture. The focus, the the story, is entirely on what we do naturally when we have the chance to keep in touch with each other, as of course we want to do. David Morley and Charlotte Brunston had a brilliant phrase for the myth of the mediated centre, the first myth, at its mass media peak in the late 70s, the nation now. Today, when Facebook offers to tell the story of our lives, a quote from Mark Zuckerberg, we have us now. Of course, this myth is not yet fully established. If the myth of the mediated centre took decades to become so, the myth of us too will only fully stabilise over time. And I'm not either the first to detect a bit of mystification here. Christian Fuchs and Josef van Dijk have brought out the competing norms at work in the proprietary business models of social media. However, we see the myth's effects in accounts of political protests across the world, for example, in the past three years as Twitter or Facebook revolutions, or in The Guardian's recent listing of us as the media personality of 2013. But you might say, why talk of myth again? Why disenchant what's just good fun? Well, because we must be wary when our most important moments of coming together seem to be captured in what people happen to do on platforms whose economic value is based on generating just such an idea of natural collectivity. Think, it wouldn't be enough for Facebook, for example, to say that lots of small groups unknown to each other do roughly the same banal things behind virtual closed doors, It's vital to the value claims on which Facebook depends for it to open as many of those interconnecting doors as possible and claim that Facebook is what we are now doing together. We, the collectivity of everyday people everywhere. Vague as it is, this claim grounds any number of specific rhetorics and judgments about what's happening, what's trending, and so, by a self-accumulating logic, what matters. For government, society, business, and for us. The myth of us, however, because it's loosely focused across vast platforms, in Facebook's case, 1.1 billion users in over 200 countries, requires a special type of analysis. Michel Foucault, in his book The Archaeology of Knowledge, used the term system of dispersion for patterns of communication, documentation and action that are rule-like across many different sites. And he talks all that time ago of practices that systematically form the objects of which they speak. So remember, there is no collectivity, no us, of the sort we have come to talk about around social media until those platforms attract us, whoever we are, to use them and to link to them. 
The myth of us is even less of a belief system than the myth of the mediated centre. It's more a basic form of orientation, what Andrea Janssen has called the centripetal dynamic of always checking in. So routine that it requires not a hermeneutic of suspicion, there's often little to deconstruct, but a hermeneutic of tracking, tracking us as we perform the act of being us on platforms that propose we do just that. But the myth of us is spawning academic discourses that do, I think, need some deconstruction, some suspicion. Take Rainey and Wellman's book network that I mentioned earlier, where they claim that we're witnessing the rise of a different social order, a network social operating system that gives people new ways to solve problems and meet social needs. The new media, they write, is the new neighbourhood. There are two problems with such language. First, rhetoric about the social does the work of analysis. What do these writers mean by social? Does it relate to what we have meant by that word in the past? If it doesn't, does that matter? Second, such writing is silent about the other, possibly also social or even antisocial features of the territory across which this us is gathered. The myth of us, like all myth, disguises the other knowledges it helps us lose along the way. So we need to disenchant such rhetorical claims about the new social world that platform-based networks make possible. Now, one route to doing this is to think a bit more about the economics of such platforms. Here, very much, I borrow, bother, uh, borrow on other people's work. I'm no economist, so I don't claim to be. Social platforms benefit a very different type of advertiser for mass broadcasting. An advertiser who's concerned with reaching not big audiences, gathering simultaneously at a particular place, but individuals tracked serially as they cross the media landscape, including on social media. And we all know that the tracking of our activity on social media is the basis of the value Facebook sells to advertisers and indirectly to the new data mining industry that has emerged to create additional value out of that data. As Joseph Thoreau explains in his book, The Daily You, traditional media, to survive, must deal with this new industry, often offering their own data-gathering capacities to tempt potential advertisers. The social at which media processes are targeted now is being reconstructed all around us. In a video roadshow just before Facebook's flotation last year, Mark Zuckerberg claimed that Facebook is, quote, a fabric that can make any experience online social. Sounds more like a social theorist than many social theorists so-called. The value in this newly constructed social domain is unimaginable, though, without a third myth, the myth of big data. Now, of course, big data, the huge capacities of computer-based analysis now increasingly influencing science, corporate and governmental agendas, is not itself mythical. Massive computing capacity really is vital to discovering complex patterns in huge data sets, for example, in the medical field. The servers that manage the flow of our everyday communications really do involve huge costs. On one estimate, nearly uh, 150 billion US dollars a year. And there really is a practical problem of interpreting all the data now circulating. As an example, a recent Japanese film launch this August generated 150,000 tweets per second. So if you took six to seven seconds to read and respond, you have to respond to any one, another million would already be there by the time you finished. But I'm interested here, as with the first two myths I've discussed, particularly in the claims now being made about what big data can achieve for understanding the social world. Those claims matter, in part, because big data capacity is increasingly integrated now into advertising and marketing in the form of the means to track vast numbers of individuals. Data company Axiom claims to track more than 700 million consumers globally, all the time. So big data affects the wider field where market-based media compete for funding. More broadly, big data's advocates' claims about what counts as social knowledge affect all of us interested in producing social knowledge, whether in the media 
or in academic disciplines that research the social, as Mike Savage and Roger Burroughs warned a few years back in a renowned article, The Coming Crisis of Empirical Sociology. Big Data's new politics of measurement, termed from the anthropologist James Scott, is changing the terrain on which all large institutions, including governments, can claim to tell us the way things are. Now, again, I'm not the first to talk of myth in relation to big data. Tom Deutsch, a commentator on IBM datamag.com, maybe you follow him, writes of the vendor myths about the qualities or problems of big data sets. More deeply, Kate Crawford at MIT's Center for Civic Media, who with Dana Boyd has done so much to draw academic attention to the issues around big data, Kate Crawford has spoken of the myths about the neutrality of big data sets and our chances of avoiding ever being identified by big data gatherers. As she noted, big data is something we create, but it's also something we imagine. Absolutely. And I'm concerned here with an even more wide-ranging act of imagination that connects big data practices to our very possibilities for social knowledge. Let me take an example. Victor Meyer Schoenberger's and Kenneth Kukier's book, Big Data, A Revolution That Will Transform the Way We Live, Work and Think. They celebrate the fact that in response to the almost impossible challenge of making sense of the vast masses of data that we can now collect, analysts are giving up on specific hypotheses and instead focusing on generating through countless parallel calculations a really good proxy for whatever is associated with a phenomenon. And they're relying on that proxy as the predictor. Now, sometimes the proxy makes indirect interpretative sense, as in the controversial case they report, and others have too, where American retailer Target started communicating with a young woman on the basis that she was pregnant. Her father then found out that way that she might be pregnant. Just because she had started buying a basket of consumer products that their predictive model associated with women who would shortly start buying pregnancy products because they had then discovered that they were pregnant. Sometimes, however, the proxy makes no interpretive sense at all. Indeed, this is the author's point. This lack of sense doesn't matter, they argue, because a really good proxy, once discovered, will help us see regularity across vast numbers of variables that would otherwise be invisible. The result, though, is to undercut the rationale of not just qualitative methods of analysis, my main area, but also of the interpretive models, the hermeneutics, if you like, that for decades have driven large-scale survey research. And if we reject the very possibility of such hermeneutics of any sort, such hermeneutics of the social, then we also, of course, disarm hermeneutic critique, which makes the big myth of big data armor-plated against criticism. So let's follow this troubling third myth in a bit more detail. Myth, as I've often argued following Maurice Block from the LSE and Roland Barthes, it works through ambiguity. To sometimes claiming to offer truth and at other times claiming to be merely playful, not trying for the truth. Providing what in the George W. Bush era was called plausible deniability, but here at the level of claims about knowledge claims can always get away with it. You are either playing with the truth or you really were true this time, so this is serious, you've got to pay attention. So, Maya, Schoenberg and Kukier, on the one hand, say big data, to get our attention, bring an essential enrichment in human comprehension. They go further, proposing a large project of datafication that involves quantifying every aspect of everyday phenomena to enable big data analysts to find its hidden order. The result, they say, will be a great infrastructure project like Diderot's 18th century encyclopedia. Quotes, this enormous treasure chest of datafied information, once analysed, will shed light on social dynamics at all levels for the individual to society at large. They also think the world will look different. We will no longer regard our world as a string of happenings that we explain as a natural or social phenomenon, but as a universe comprised essentially of information. 
On the other hand, when the moral consequences of actually acting on the basis of big data seem a bit problematic, for example, do we arrest people for offences that we've merely predicted they're going to commit? Because we don't really want them to commit it. Well, then they back off, and they say that big data only provide probabilities, not actualities, and they worry about fetishising the output of our data analysis. Maya Schoenberger and Kukies is just one of many books making similarly mythical claims about big data. A trailblazing article in 2007 by Wired magazine editor Chris Anderson called The End of Theory announced that big access to big data, which he was very excited about, means out with every theory of human behaviour, from linguistics to sociology, forget taxonomy, ontology, psychology. Why? Because the proxies that big data generate are good enough. Or as Google's research director, who he quotes, put it, you can succeed without them. But success for who? For what purpose? In the service of whose or what notion of knowledge? Google's clearly, which is nice. And that of many other data processing institutions, big and small. But I think the unintended side effects for the rest of us may be less positive. Writing about how government's understanding of and decision-making about its populations will increasingly rely on big data, Evelyn Rupert of Goldsmiths suggests that we will all get used to being governed, not on the basis of our individual features, not even hypothetically, but on the basis that we are data doubles from the perspective of government, data doubles that will supplant older notions of the general population. Predictive strings, if you like, that tell those who care what, say, a man in his 50s, an ex-lawyer with a certain educational background, might be doing on the Thursday evening in November. <laughs> and as with all the myths I've discussed, we too are involved in its reproduction, supplying information to government and countless other collectors, including, of course, social media platforms, about what we do as we do it, allowing that information to supplant other possible types of information about ourselves and how we might be reflecting on our situation. Algorithmic practices are now, for example, at the core of states' modes of managing border security risk, as geographer Louise Amor shows. So in development now is a quite distinctive working model of what human beings are that validates new types of evidence and expertise and supplants other knowledges of our present and our futures. To disenchant this myth, we need a new type of interpretation or hermeneutic, what paradoxically we might call a hermeneutic of the anti-hermeneutic. Judith Butler provides a clue to this when in her book Precarious Life, discussing how a media of excessive spectacle, too much showing, I think we know what she means, narrows our grasp of the human. And she writes that in this sort of case, there's less a dehumanising discourse at work here than a refusal of discourse. So it's the gaps and breaks in our languages of social interpretation, authorised by the myth of big data on which we must focus. But if the big data model works by equating our only forms of social knowledge with such probabilities, then we've already started organising things so that the single story, your story, my story really doesn't matter. And that raises fundamental questions about individual voice and the way that voice is valued or not in our societies. A link back to another theme in my earlier work. The myth of big data is oriented to the social world differently from the other myths I've discussed. It doesn't have as its domain a national population or even the particular collectivities that might gather online in a particular place. It builds its population data bit by data bit through a series of operations that bypass earlier ideas of social interrelations. Its new form of social knowledge splits up discourse populations, the groups that we could once talk about as populations for various purposes. It fractures the space of discourse depicting its data subjects in ways that really don't connect anymore with the space of action and thought in which individuals think they live. And it stretches the time of discourse, 
aggregating action fragments from any moment in a stream of a person's recorded acts into patterns that may bear a little relationship to how those people themselves understand the sequence and meaning of their actions. Combine all of this, mystify it through the myth of big data, and you risk replacing older ways of talking about the social world that can still be related to social actors, us, with myriad data strings that lack any elements that connect with how individuals with recognisable sets of human aims and capabilities make sense of what they do. And so, since hermeneutics and the exchange of signs is the basis of social life, in installing the myth of big data into our working practices for generating and attributing knowledge, we risk unravelling the social itself. Or at least, and this is surely pretty important already, the languages of social description on which not just sociology, but also justice and politics have relied. We risk building a social landscape peopled by what 19th century Russian novelist Nikolai Gogol called dead souls. Human entities that have financial value, in his novel, if you remember, I strongly recommend it, the value is mortgageable assets of dead serfs, not yet registered as dead by the government. In our new world, the value is as unwitting data producers, but these dead souls are not alive, not at least in the sense that we know human beings to be alive. And yet this transformation may not anymore seem peculiar to us, in Bernard Williams' word, because we become accustomed to giving accounts of ourselves in such data-saturated ways on social networking sites and elsewhere. And if such habits become established long-term, we may lose the sense that our collective life could lie anywhere else than in such datafied forms. And this matters, not just to those like me with a vested interest in certain ways of talking about the social. It matters to all citizens, to all those who would be citizens. The corporate interests, and increasingly the state too, aspires to know us through big data. As John Lanchester put it in a fine Guardian article in September, the surveillance capacities of the American and British states operate increasingly on the principle that all they need is everything. Now, it would be a mistake to see the problem here as simply the big bad state. I don't think the state is bad, necessarily. I'm not concerned either with prism or tempera tonight. My point is that the myth of big data has already rationalised a state of affairs where a network of data gathering and data amalgamating institutions has or aspires to have everything, what Axim calls big marketing data. As governments and corporations increasingly prioritise access to big data in their visions of how they will govern or profit or both, we're only a step away from the fact, not the myth, of continuous surveillance from all directions as the new basis of how societies and the world are ordered. So what can we do about this? It's not enough simply to reject the myth of big data. Jaron Lanier, the famous inventor of virtual reality in the early 1990s, insists in a recent book that people, not algorithms, are the only sources or destinations of information. I agree with him. But when a vast attempt is underway to build a different account of how and why people matter, it's not just enough to say that that people matter. We need an alternative account of why knowledge about people matters for understanding the social. And indeed, why the social matters, if understood as more than just a probability set, proper predicting whether I'll raise my arm in the next few minutes. Media institutions, as sites from which important claims about the social still get made, can surely make a positive contribution here. Yes, we can easily ignore... Imagine media producing reality games that could convert big data proxies into entertaining prediction. A reality TV format, originally from Colombia, that was built around a lie detector, which is basically a small big data machine, had already anticipated that. It's very popular. But media, we should remember, at their best, present us with the force of this person's account of what happened to them, of how their life has gone. 
exemplary bodies and voices. Conversely, we should not expect that academic critique is always very helpful here. There's no room for hermeneutics, for example, in the anti-humanist analysis of media technologies developed by Friedrich Kittler, concerned only with media's role in, quotes, the channeling of signals. Nor is there, I think, in the social analysis, well-meaning though it is, based on affect, such as Patricia Clough's, which claims that capitalism and database securitization, bad things, have produced a world where pre-conscious, pre-individual affect modulation, I'm quoting from her, is all there is. Such analysis, I think, by abandoning any language for interpreting what human subjects mean by their action, condemns us like sleepwalkers to submit to the very changes that it condemns. Indeed, I'm troubled by the misalignment of social imaginaries, Charles Taylor's term, implied by today's competing accounts of how we get to know our shared world. Some critical theory, so-called, operates with a social imaginary that fits perfectly well with the imaginings of big data discourse because it renounces any claim to interpret social meaning. But in the process, it loses touch with the imaginary that was for so long social science's starting point. Weber's account of sociology as the science which attempts the interpretative understanding of social action. As my colleague Robin Mansell argues in her book, Imagining the Internet, we cannot move beyond deep misalignments such as this unless we build new imaginaries or at least renew our hold on old ones. Challenging the myth of big data means reaffirming in some version, I stress that in some version, We need to change many things, no doubt. Reaffirming the hermeneutic principles of the Weberian model of social science. Otherwise, social science risks being washed away with the end of theory. And it means reconnecting this hermeneutic principle with today's genuine excitement about what access to very large data sets might mean for the future of social science and for citizens. I want to end by discussing the implications of all this for two specific domains, very briefly, agency and injustice. First, agency, by which I mean not brute acts of clicking on this button, pressing like to this post, but following Weber, the longer processes of action based on reflection, giving an account of what one has done, even more basically making sense of the world so as to act within it. Now, it is easy to give up on agency in a world where so many of our acts are fed into predictive models that have no interest anymore in meaning. One response to the rise of big data is to argue that, regrettably, all agency has now been subsumed by algorithmic power. But this confuses big data's discourse's mythical vision of a ready-to-be-datified universe for the much messier world we actually live in. New forms of agency are emerging that do not ignore the seeming inevitability today of being watched and counted, but they address and they deal with them. The starting points for hermeneutics of the social world are in key ways being transformed by big data and by the embedding of algorithmic calculation in the everyday. And we need, I think, a new type of social research to address this. And I call this research social analytics. That is the study of how social actors are themselves using analytics, data measures of all kinds, including those they have developed and customised, to meet their own ends. For example, by interpreting the world in new ways. As Yanis Kalinikos of the LSE points out, data only becomes information when it is interpreted, when it passes through hermeneutics. In a world that's starting to be shaped by the myth of big data, social analytics tracks alternative projects of self-knowledge, group knowledge, institutional knowledge, projects whose ends are not the tracking of data for its own sake or even for profit, but for broader social, civic, cultural or political goals. It also tracks people's practices of resisting the introduction of analytics-based tools as default forms of management or evaluation. As Susan Scott at the LSE Department of Management points out, try working in the travel industry these days and see if TripAdvisor is your friend or not. Conversely, a social analytics would track those using analytics, even big data, to build new forms of civic and social action, for example, to govern cities in radically new ways. 
The idea of social analytics emerged from the story circle project that I led until this summer at Goldsmiths, particularly a project that we do with the community reporter organisation in the north of England, and we're delighted to see many of uh, the team from Story Circle here. Um, it struck us in doing this project that in the digital world, where to be is to be already measured, being an organisation with social ends is challenging. A challenge, if you like, of sociological interest to those of us who are still concerned with meaningfully oriented behaviour, as Weber had it. For there, in how organisations gather data about their website's workings, how they think about metadata and its uses, reflect on how, as organisations, they might change in response to such information, there, in raw form, our everyday battles to make sense of a data-saturated world in terms of social actors' own goals and not the goal of data production alone. So, a world of algorithmic power may, if we pay attention, reveal new forms of interpretative agency, and not just for the massively powerful. But it also involves, my final point, distinctive forms of injustice. All the myths I've discussed tonight rationalise massive concentrations of symbolic resource, all therefore involve an injustice of a sort. Such injustices are difficult to name, precisely because they involve concentrations of power over the resources for naming. But the injustices associated with the myths that I've discussed play out rather differently. The power asymmetries involved in mediated centres, the BBC, the, the National Territory of Britain, and so on, it's a broadcasting territory, these are so embedded in the organisation of modernity and its spaces for claiming justice that it's very difficult now to see how we can operate without them. Indeed, when genuine injustices occur through the operations of mass media, such as the UK phone hacking scandals, they are really difficult to resolve. We don't know how to unpick things. Some do. Some know how to do it, but it's very difficult to persuade people to unpick this infrastructure that we live through, that is the order of our polity. However, the injustices associated with the newer myths of us and the big data may have even more fundamental consequences for the longer term. Take the digital infrastructure on which both social media and big data collection depend. As American legal scholar Julie Cohen notes, we all increasingly operate in our daily lives in networked space. But, as she writes, the configuration of networked space is increasingly opaque to its users. We all know that. Indeed, she argues, today's web of protocols and passwords, data requirements and data monitoring has created a system of governance that is authoritarian in the sense that there seems little alternative but to comply with it. And here, at the intersection between the desire to do just what we ordinarily do and the new information sectors need to track us across this datafied space of appearances, here a vast power asymmetry is emerging that would not, I suspect, be tolerated if it were exclusively state power that was benefiting. But as I noted earlier, we cannot easily prevent the state seeking to benefit from the big data gathering infrastructure. And here we return by another route to the fundamental link between communication, the social, and the institutions that acquire dominant power over our accounts of social knowledge. In Amartya Sen's recent reworking of the theory of justice, communication is the site where life, the life well comparisons that ground claims of injustice get made. As he puts it at the end of his book, The Idea of Justice, it's bad enough that the world in which we live has so much deprivation of one kind or another. It would be even more terrible if we were not able to communicate, respond, and altercate. And yet through the myth of big data, we are starting to give credence to a working model of social knowledge that operates as if the explanation of human action and the processes of meaning-making on which such explanation has relied don't matter anymore. As Chris Anderson put it, who knows why people do what they do? The point is they do it. Well, while this earthly pragmatism has a certain charm, it turns its back on the hermeneutics that remains fundamental to our best understanding of social science. Big data rhetoric 
is the latest example of what philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer once called the alienation of the interpreter from the interpreted. I simply don't believe that Chris Anderson doesn't care why he does what he does. It's always tempting, though, to think that the latest large claims for social knowledge are new, and so must this time change humankind's possibilities for a good life. It must work this time. The history of new media and communications technologies is littered with such predictions. Indeed, we can find echoes in big data discourse of a problem that Friedrich Schiller captured over two centuries ago in his comments on earlier languages of state building. And these were very small states he was talking about. He wrote that the state remains forever a stranger to its citizens since at no point does it ever make contact with their feeling. Forced to resort to classification in order to cope with the variety of its citizens and never to get an impression of humanity except through representation at second hand, the governing sector ends up by losing sight of them altogether, confusing their concrete reality for a mere construct of the intellect. While the governed cannot but receive with indifference laws which scarcely, if at all, are directed at them as persons. As Schiller saw, a polity based on an impoverished model of the human subject cannot expect much loyalty from or legitimacy with those it governs. The warning holds whether it's governments or dense networks of corporations that are pr promoting the construct of the intellect in question. The right response is not to walk away from the challenges and opportunities to which today's new forms of social interconnection and information generation give rise, but instead to make sure that in facing those challenges and thinking creatively about those opportunities, we take care to hold on to our richer accounts of human agency and knowledge and to the sense of possible democratic agency and possible justice whose basic components they supply. That is what, for me at least, is at stake in the work on our changing infrastructures of media, communications and information that I want to do here at LSC in the coming years. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nick, for that wonderful and uh, tour de force exploring the challenge of, of big data and de debunking its uh, excesses so effectively. We have about 20 minutes or so for comments, questions. I suggest what we do is we gather a few questions up and then leave, leave Nick a chance to respond to them. So uh, I'm going to open the, the floor to questions and we'll take, try to take three or four to go. Who, would, who wants to start? Very shy. Ah. But, um, uh, behind the us and the individual and the human and the social uh, terms that you're using all the way through, uh, there's a, there, there seems to be almost some kind of uh, uh, kind of the, a notion of the real social, the real individual, the real as behind all such media or big data representations and manipulations thereof. But but I didn't get a, quite a sense of uh, how you would define that itself. I felt that that remained a kind of sort of distant platonic <laughs> thing rather than something that you, I could detect, you know, you were, you were willing to commit yourself to, 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 uh, to saying that there is a, if there are older notions of the us or the social and so forth, what, uh, what are they? What, what would you, do, do they need resurrecting in some way? Is there something you would point to that uh, is, uh, uh, compete with the ones that big data offers? Are there any more questions before, from the front there? Um, that was a great talk, really nice to hear it. Um, I'm interested in a sort of practical question, working within academia, I'm interested in what kinds of departments and what kinds, what kinds of departments, say here at the LSE, might be interested in diving into big data feet first with a very positive 
attitude uh-huh. towards it because I'm constantly um, meeting very engaged students who, who've just met big data and they're very happy and they've got a big smile on their face. It feels like this is a nice new thing and it, it feels really a shame to break their hearts you know, by saying, oh, let's poke a big hole in this lovely balloon. And it often seems to me that people come from other departments and then they say, oh, you just don't understand how that is useful, say, in management theory, or you don't understand how that might help us with governance. This is really, really useful. And and this is actually something that I I heard quite recently in a talk from a colleague from the States, um, someone in our field, someone who perhaps should know better but was, you know, acclaiming big data as as the next big thing. So this is not just something that the companies are putting out there. It's an academic phenomenon. There's one that by the back then, in the blue. Hi there. Um, the construal of individuals and of collectives is changing, and proxies, as you say, are new and strange. But the questions that we're asking about big data, I mean, in many respects, they're still the same kinds of questions. You know, what will people buy? Where will crime be committed? You know, so on. Does that perhaps mean that traditional hermeneutics is a bit more robust in allowing us to tackle these, these issues, the issue of big data? OK, should we take a few responses? Yeah, Nick? Um, is hermeneutics more robust? Well, uh, hermeneutics isn't necessarily trying to generate perfect predictive models for you know, what sets of products are going to be bought in certain time slots. It's, it's aiming at something different. Now, I'm not against, as I stressed at the end of the lecture, linking to Shaka's point, I'm not against the use of big data. I said it's real. It has uses. Uh, if used with an appropriate hermeneutics, still linked to what we have with social science, it could be very interesting. And I'm entirely open to that. And Mike and I are hoping, you know, we're, link- we're thinking about bids in this area. So when you're talking about working other departments at LSE, I'm linking to your question already. Clearly, we want to do that. But I think it's very important to hold on um, to what's at stake in using big data. Lots of things are very useful for states. We want to concentrate on the things which are useful for states, which are actually promote research, promote an understanding of human beings, which enable possibilities of justice societies, not the things which are just useful. So we have to ask, first of all, that direct question. When you mean useful, in what sense, for whom, for what purpose exactly? Is that the same purpose that your previous research was useful? Because I don't think it is. There's been this shift of the ground, which is what I was trying to point out. Um, By the way, the authors I was quoting from from the Oxford Internet Institute, Um, their colleagues, academics in the area of big data, but, and they're critical in aspects of the book, but they slip into this myth, which I think is profoundly dangerous. So I think we, the reason I put the argument so generally, Shaku, as I did, which is, is that I think if you take the myth of big data, it undercuts all four forms of social science. It undercuts the best economics. It undercuts any notion of political theory, political science. It ha- will have a devastating, pardon the word, in a sense, a cleansing effect of our territory. It's extremely dangerous if we have to take it seriously. That's why I wrote this speech, because I'm very, very concerned about it. But we, we have to be open in that discussion, and we have to for, force people to put their cards on the table. That's not to say that big data isn't useful for certain purposes. Let's find out whether cancer cures are helped by detecting variables in a million different uh, uh, patterns in a million different variables. At the moment, we haven't a clue where the pattern is. I'm not against that. I'm against the myth that is going with that package, which we attach to the bulk of social science funding in the future. Uh, Going back to Mike's question, thanks, Mike, for the question. Uh, I deliberately didn't find the the social. Well, that's a very good question. I don't think the social is something you can define. William Sewell, the social theorist, one of those social theorists I most admire, in a wonderful essay on the social, argues that the social is the one where we cannot define, but we must hold on to, because it is the word that points to that mass of interconnections between us that enables us to have a sense that we are human together. But it takes an infinite number of forms. So what, the reason why I'm concerned, and I'm not the only one, Josie van Dijk has written a brilliant book on the topic, concerned with, and so has Ulysses Mackey has too, on, if you like, the appropriation by Facebook 
and so on, of certain versions of the social, is that it closes down other possibilities. And as Jose van Dijk points out, almost encourages to forget what the social was like before Facebook, which, after all, was less than a decade ago. We need to keep the possibilities open. That's, that's the way I would answer your question. OK, some more questions at the front there. Uh, hi. Thanks, David, for such an unexpectedly brilliant lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, just want to ask a question about the section toward the end of your lecture uh, about how do we respond. Do you think it's essential for effectiveness of response to have some sort of core organization that builds it together and moves on. Uh, with Stephen Coleman, a few years ago, we advocated a so-called civic commons inside of the space. Hopelessly unrealistic. Uh, well, what have we got around the houses now? We've got some public broadcasting organizations. And according to James Curran's research, they do a better informative job than commercial broadcasters. But really, the way they look these days, looking into the future, they're going to be on their defensive back feet rather than taking the kinds of steps that your analysis might uh, uh, presume was, uh, was, 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 yeah. was right. So... Um, have I asked a question that's premature, perhaps? We have to wait and see what comes up. Or is there something that can be organised? OK, there's another question here, I think. <coughs> yes, sir. I was just going to say, as someone who was studying social sciences in the late 60s and was occupying LSE in 1968, this might sound like a very Marxist question... However, uh, on a, as a non-academic question, the digital world and social platforms, at their worst, um, produce isolated, individualised, narcissistic individuals who cannot uh, uh, operate in social situations. Um, and therefore, my uh, looking forward to the next 100 years, well, I won't be here, um, <laughs> are we going to look at either people destroying big data or having the influence to change big data, or just not using big data. Mm. OK, there's one more question, I think, over there. Yes, if you can find... <coughs> Thank you. Hi, Nick. Um, Thank you, that was an expectedly brilliant lecture, because I know you. <laughs> um, um, t two points, or it's the same point, really. First is just to credit you with a very ingenious um, um, kind of diversion of the notion of analytics, social analytics. Uh, as someone who's just come out of journalism recently, uh, where Google Analytics is sold as the Holy Grail, I think it's a very ingenious idea. Um, you, you noted that there were people... Uh, social analytics will also look at the way in which people were using their own version of data or... A hermeneutics of data. Can you just give us a couple of examples of that to sort of ground that idea a bit? Yeah. OK, yeah. good. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Jay, how do we respond? Um, I'll say two things quickly, because clearly we are at the beginning. Uh, I guess I wouldn't have written that speech in the way I did if I didn't feel this was a relatively new, urgent thing we, we just have to pay attention to for a long time. So we are at the beginning, but it's not premature to raise the institutional questions, for sure. Uh, two things I'd say. One is I think it's imperative that universities collaborate. Um, some may be big enough to operate on their own. Um, it's an area where I hope Goldsmiths and LSE will be collaborating. Servers and the analytic capacity to analyse trillions of tweets cost a hell of a lot of money. Uh, and that will close down the places where that thinking could go on. And we have to uh, uh, make alliances across universities. It's imperative to do that now. Um, but the other side of it is, as you say, very importantly, the industry sector, the media industries. Joseph Thoreau's book, The Daily You, I think he's the one person who couldn't be here I most would have wanted here because he's the book, that's the book that's most inspired me and most shocked me in the past 10 years, I would say, brings out how... Those in the media industries have no choice now but to ingest, if you like, the cancer of big data calculation. 
into their ways of operating. And to say, well, if, you, if we change the story that way for that type of person, maybe you'll get some more advertising data about that type of person. Would that be okay, Mr. Advertiser? In other words, undercutting the very notion of what we need journalism for, which is to provide common information. So they face the most intense pressure, which they cannot escape because they've already ingested it in the bloodstream. So I think we have to, first of all, be as strong as we can in naming what we see as the dangers. We're not doing our job if we don't speak clearly and directly. And secondly, we have to understand how extraordinarily hard it is for them. And how on earth can they create alliances? That's why The Guardian's recent role against another aspect of the problem is extraordinarily important. But they're doing it through alliances. Again, The Guardian, New York Times, Frankfurt Argument Zeitung. It's essential. So I think this is a very large-scale battle. So alliances is a very good point you made. Um, now, moving on. Jane's point about, thank you, Jane, about how do people resist? Well, we're, again, we're at the beginning because we're only beginning to see the problem. I think... Um, I can't predict how, what people will smash and, uh, and what forms their inchoate anger will take. But I'm really struck when people like sober legal scholars like Julie Cohen from the Georgetown Law Institute in the States wrote a book called Configuring the Network Self, full of legal commentary on cases here and there, pointing out that we are mutually accepting an authoritarian system of governance which just happens to be governing us. That's striking. And it's so striking that we actually are dumb, not knowing how to begin to resist, precisely because there are very few alternatives at the moment. Well, obviously, there are open source uh, solutions. There are various other ways of building alternative infrastructure, but they're only at the beginnings. So the reason I'm interested in social analytics, and we have Nodja Maris here, who from another angle is coming at similar issues, is to look at how real social actors meeting their actual social needs, not some theoretical diagram, are trying to fix this. What are they trying to do? What resources can they draw upon? What alliances can they build? How can they build alternative infrastructure? This seems to me a crucial question for sociology today because it's the real battle going on. It's nothing to do with the great theoretical battles about whether the nature of power has changed in the abstract. It's of no consequence to anyone. What matters is what are people doing in relation to this real-world challenge? Casper, um, thank you for your question. Um, examples. Well, I'm, I started to get onto that in a way. Our case study from the Story Circle uh, project, which Luke here and Aristea did fantastic work on, was a difficult project because that project, uh, the community reporters we were working with, had very few resources. They were committed to giving community reporters voice. They knew they had to do it digitally. They knew they needed metadata. They didn't, hope now, they didn't know how to translate that into a set, a sequence of actions. So we tried to think through with them what that would mean. We hope they're still continuing on that. But they were at a very early stage, and we realized through that project how hard that is when you have limited resource to take the ideal of your social ends, translate that through a massively complex technological interface into a set of actions that you, with your limited resources, can actually fulfill. That's hard. That interests me sociologically, but it's also, I believe, in that sort of struggle. So there's, there's that sort of case. I did have another example written down, which I can't, uh, can't quite remember at the moment. We have, um, well, we have Sebastian Kabitschko in the audience who's doing research on the Chaos Computer Club in Germany, which is a very important organisation, because for 20, 30 years it's been trying to develop a new metapolitics about information and data and to bring into the social space thinking about the politics of how uh, digital information works as a primary uh, political topic, not a marginal one. That's a broad way of resisting, if you like. And there was a third one, which I can't remember at the moment. It might come back to me. Sorry. OK, perhaps one, one last round of questions. If I can use my chair's position to ask you one question, Nick. I mean, one, one way of reading your talk, particularly with reference to Weber at the end, this is sort of a defence of an interpretive hermeneutic. Yeah. So, I just wondered how you, how you therefore would respond to the kind of post-humanist um, currents in, in sociology. I mean, obviously, the active network theory, STS studies. Is that something which you would want to build into your alliance or, or, or not? I don't see active network theory as post-humanist. It's just playing, <coughs> busking at being post-humanist. It's quite right. clear that uh, Bruno Latour, with all his brilliance, is motivated by a profound sense of urgent inquiry into the nature of 
human life and, and the contingent ways that our words, our terms, attach onto the world. It's a philosophical drive that links it, which is a form of hermeneutic. I think it's, that's what's so passionate and exciting about it. So I don't believe that actor network theory is post-humanist. And I, I've, I often asked, aren't you sounding a bit humanist tonight? And I said, yes, what are you? <laughs> I don't, I've never seen a post-humanist yet. <laughs> Um, because if you are prepared to disown the values that get you up in the morning, that will end your life, that enable you to begin other people's lives, then what sort of bad faith is that? But it's very common in academia, and I won't have any trouble with it. And I think <laughs> we have to be absolutely emphatic. This is a time when humanist values are directly at stake. So if we don't defend them, we lose them. Okay, I saw... People hands come out now. <laughs> uh, 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 yes, yeah, Stephen, you're thinking of first. Yeah. <clears throat> so this should be the last round. We'll take three questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish. Thank you. And Nick, welcome back. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed that, and I don't demur from mo- many of your points. The thing that was striking me, though, was something about the the politics of our research community because it struck me that if you look at the history of the constant increase and resources going into arriving where we are today to have the computational capacity to have big data at all, in a sense, all of the focus now on big data is distracting attention from all of the interpretations and misinterpretations and reinterpretations of the data we already have. And so that as we focus on the next generation, it's almost like a new label for something that has been around for a long time. And I wonder if you could respond to the politics of that, because funding is now going to go hugely into anything that calls itself big data. What about the rest? Thank you. A couple more questions. Um, in, the, in the middle there, yep. Hi there. Um, With regard to big data um, and uh, league tables, geodata and the like, would you choose to buy a house in a known crime hotspot and have surgery performed by a surgeon at the bottom, at the wrong end of a league table? Good question. And one more, I think, yeah, over there. This is really horrible. I have the last question, so I'm going to, Nick, ask you kind of perhaps a provocative but a very simple question. That is, beyond the NSA, let's say, or Twitter Twitter or Facebook, the platforms that you spoke about, what are we talking about in terms of big data? Um, It strikes me as though corporations are trying to uh, enclose the data that they have. So can you locate for us where this data is? Ah in fact, coming from, being collected, being analyzed. Even. Okay, thank you, Nick. Right. Um, well, Robin's point about not needing to lose touch with the errors of the past and the, the, the traditional social science problems which may get forgotten in this, that's obviously very important. And that's one way I, against my instinct, deliberately framed the argument in a conservative way, apparently. I don't think it's conservative to hold on to what worked in the past, uh, actually, (laughs) if you're considering defending other things which may be a threat. Um, So I think we do have to look at those issues. We have to go on asking some traditional social science questions. That's why I enjoyed Mike's uh, lecture last night on class so much, because it asked one of the classic social science questions using quantitative research, hermeneutically, not big data in the sense that it's anti-hermeneutic, precisely hermeneutic. So we have to hold on to that. So we must, at the same time as we make the point that Shaku encouraged me to emphasise, we also have to make that point. We need to hold on to those other questions. I quite agree. The geodata point, well, of course, yes, it's, if the information's there, then one follows it. But I don't think, again, that is not what I mean by big data. You were talking about actual useful statistics about distributions and things, which are part of how uh, moderately rational 
citizens now pay attention to. I do think there are other areas where the generation of excessive statistics, fake statistics, say in the school sector or the health sector, can actually profoundly distort the way actors behave in relation and disalign them from their professional goals. And we know the long histories of that. That's an abuse of statistics, but there are good uses too, and I'm entirely in favour of the use of statistics. I tried to stress that. It's big data is something different. It's not the beast we know at all. It's a very different use of vast data sets. So that's, that's what the point I was making. And um, what are we talking about? Yes, thanks, Greg. I mean, um, you're more expert on this than me. <laughs> this is closer to your area. I got excited because I think this affects the issues around the core of social sciences and, I'm, and the core of communications research that I'm particularly interested in. But I, the way I would put it is this, that clearly at the moment big data resources are highly concentrated. And people will try and hold them. That's the nature of power. That's why I put it in this long-term sequence of the concentration of symbolic resource. It's a new, massive form of that. However, I think, again, if you read Joe Turow's book, he's arguing that there's a certain logic to this accumulation of data that now affects pretty well all organisations that are trying to survive in this competitive space. So the competition to generate more data that could add to someone else's big data pool becomes overwhelming. And I think we therefore have to think about this as a cultural logic, not just as a material uh, resource. So that's the way I'd look at it. I'm sure there are, there are many places that are not yet datafied, uh, much to the disappointment of our Oxford Internet Institute friends, I think, thank God for that. Uh, datification is potentially profoundly corrosive, but there are areas like the health service, uh, particularly in America, the, move, the, the shift of private health insurance now to making the patient the data producer produces a sort of permanent production of data, which I'm not sure is the life I want to live, but we are being encouraged to live that. So we are helping to fix the problem, if you like. And I think that itself is damaging. We need to think about the consequences of that. OK, I think we should draw it to a close. Just two announcements before we leave. One of them is uh, Nick's book, Media Society World, is, I think, available... It's a signed copy. It? It's been signed copies. <laughs> are available outside if you want, anyone wants to buy one. And also, and importantly, um, the reception isn't outside this lecture theatre. It's in a different building. It's in the Shaw Library on the sixth floor of the old building. And if anyone doesn't know the LSE, I think there'll be a, a cohort of people wandering over there. So just follow the crowd. So can I please ask you to thank Nick again for a wonderful lecture.